Hi, I'm Chris Burns from Techie Gurus. Welcome back. So I haven't I haven't talked about this project yet, but a couple months ago I got invited to be a co-author on a book. Now there's 20 other authors other than myself, but we wrote a book and it's called Managing Your Business Risk in the Cybersecurity Minefield. Uh, we're finishing that up. My chapter's done. I wrote about testing cybersecurity. Specifically, I talk about how you should be testing your cybersecurity and methods that you can take to do that. It comes out sometime in August. We're finishing it up. We're trying to finish it by the end of July. It should be available on Amazon sometime in August. I'll have more for that later. Uh, if you look up here, here depends on where I put it when I edit it. I'll show you a picture of the cover and uh, of me, which you already see, so it doesn't really matter. But what I want to talk today uh, about is multi-factor authentication. Now, I've put tip videos out. You need to use multi-factor authentication. But what is it? Multi-factor authentication is an authentication method where you use two or more uh, verification factors to get logged in. Now traditionally, we use a username and password as one factor, and then we would use something like um, a text message as a second factor. We could use an authentication app like Duo or Authy or Google Authenticator or Microsoft Authenticator to be a second factor as well. Those are typically what we like to call one-time passwords but it can also be biometric. So everybody has a phone. We will typically use uh, either our fingerprint or our face, and that's a, that's a multi-factor authentication. Now, a lot of times you will hear about two-factor authentication, and all that is is that's basically just two factors. But when we talk about multi-factor authentication, it's two or more. So you could be required to not only use your username and password, uh, it could be a token, so a hardware token that can be used, it could be your fingerprint, and it could even be your location. So it might be, hey, if I'm not in Michigan, or if I'm not in my state, even though I've given you my username and password, and I've provided you the one-time password that I got, because I'm logging in from a different state, it would actually be blocked. Now that's way more advanced than what typically happens, but that's something that's an option. So, so let's cover a little bit about how does MFA work? So when you use something that requires a one-time password, that's something that's like that little four to six digit or longer code that's either sent to like your, your phone number as a text message, or like I said, you use like an authentication app. What it is is it's generated at the time that you register, and then it's either in incremented by a counter or by a time. And then they generate in the back end, your code just generated, it verifies that when you go to log in, and you log in. So there's three main types of MFA authentication methods. It's things you know, things you have, and things that you are. So what you know would be a password or a PIN. What you have could be your smartphone. It could be some sort of badge. It could be a to hardware token that you have. And things that you are are, are biometrics. So fingerprint, iris, retina, could be voice recognition. So let's talk about each um, factor of multi-factor authentication, let's talk about knowledge. So knowledge could be answering personal security questions. It's your password. It could be a one-time password as well. You could have something in your possession. Um, a good example of this would be your PIN for your debit card. When you go to use your debit card, it's something that you have. That's, that's, that's what we'll talk about next, possession. But then your PIN is something that you know. So let's move on to possession. Again, I just used a debit card as a good example for a possession one. Uh, possessions are, if you have a smartphone app, uh, an authenticator app that pr presents you with a one-time password, a code, that's a possession th um, factor. It could be access card badges, it could be a USB uh, device, it could be a smart card. Now those aren't commonly used uh, anymore, they used to be used more, you'll see them in a little bit of enterprises, but a small business you probably won't see that. It could be software tokens, it could be some sort of certificate, that's something that you have. Now, inherence or something that you are is fingerprints, facial recognition, um, voice, retina or iris scanning, and it could even be something about behavior. So the way that you type can be something that is you. The way that you speak is something that is you. Typically, in a small business, even medium enterprises, you're going to do something like a combination of username and password and either a one-time password, where your code gets generated and sent to you, or it could be biometric. Um, we've moved into a world now where it's passwordless authentication that you can use, you don't even have to know your password. So it's 
you know the username, right? You have the device, you have a possession of something, and then it uses your biometrics on that device, something that you are, to actually authenticate you. It's not quite down cost-wise to the small business, but it's something that is coming. So example of that would be you could walk up to your computer and you could put your username in, and it would then send a code out, it would send a signal out, and it would come to your phone, it would say, is this you? And you would use your fingerprint or your face to authenticate to your phone into the app, and then you would approve of that login, and once you did that, the computer would just log in. Now that's a breakdown, that's a slow, kind of slow breakdown of the process. Honestly, in, in reality, it happens very quickly. So you put your username in, you hit login, it sends it, you get prompted on your phone, you look at it, or you put your fingerprint on there, you hit okay, and it logs you in. So you don't even have to know your password. So what does MFA protect you against? I'll cover these really quickly. Phishing is a good example. They try to get you to log into your Office 365 or G Suite account or Google Workspace is what it's called now. You accidentally put your username and password in because you're tricked. Well, guess what? They don't have your code, so they're not going to be able to get in. Uh, spear phishing. Spear phishing is where it's more of a targeted attack. It's really well crafted and it's targeted towards either individuals or a small group. So specifically, it could be your company. Again. They're trying to get access to your credentials, but if you have if you have MFA, it won't let the login happen. Keylogger is another example. They might be able to capture the username and password. So you've accidentally clicked on something, you've downloaded it, it's collecting all of your keystrokes. You know, you type it in, it knows what your username and password is, but because it doesn't know what your your one-time password is or it doesn't have your biometrics, they still can't log in. Now there's something called credential stuffing. That's where they take advantage of the fact that users use the same username and password on multiple accounts. Now we've talked about this, it's bad practice, you shouldn't do that, but what they'll do is they'll, if they find like a combination for your email address, they'll just they'll try to use your email address and a known password and just try to apply it to different sites and see and apps and see what they can get in. And then it protects you against brute force and, re and reverse brute force attacks. So brute force is where they, an attacker tries to use a program to generate like a combination of username and passwords, they try to gain access to your account. Well guess what, even if they do gain access, even if they guess it, they're still not going to be able to get in because they still don't have the, the one-time password or biometrics or whatever you use as your, as your second factor or third factor. Um, the other thing is the man in the middle attack, right? So what that is, is they use a program that inserts itself in between the transaction of you and wherever you're trying to get to, and it tries to gather your login and credentials. It may get them, but it guess, again, it won't have the code or the biometrics for that. So that's how it really stops common cybersecurity attacks and multi-factor authentication is one of the best things you can do and it doesn't really cost you anything unless you go and need to get something like duo which will cost you a little bit of money but it does simplify the deployment process and the usability of it you can use the free ones and it, it doesn't cost you anything to actually help protect yourself better now if you're using an application on the on the internet and they don't support multi-factor authentication you should absolutely submit that through feedback and say look you need to do this now we've talked a little bit about two Text message ones aren't the best, but they're better than nothing. Especially if they obfuscate your phone number so that somebody doesn't just see your phone number because then they can go attack your phone number. So with that, uh, I think I gave you probably more information than you really care to. If you if you have any questions on any of this, on the different types of attacks, you know, I might be able to kind of cover that a little bit deeper on another video. But I'm Chris Burns, Techie Gurus. Hope you have a great week and we'll see you next week.